Um, I'm going to um, start today's meeting. I wasn't quite sure what, what I needed to do as a keynote, so uh, I'm going to give a, a bit of an overview uh, and um, make some suggestions for what I hope the, the community as a whole will engage in in, in the coming years. Uh, my focus, uh, and you can tell that we are the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research, uh, is uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, autism, and ADHD. But in fact, um, I uh, went a long way toward getting double boards in neurology, and we're including epilepsy and uh, intellectual disability on our new, uh, our next version of uh, CHIPS. And I, I agree with, uh, with Allison that uh, it really is very important. Uh, there are a lot of shared lessons, both genetically, but also uh, neurobiologically. So with that, um, here's my basic argument, uh, and it is that for neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, and so forth, depression, um, there has been an extraordinary period of stasis in therapeutics, which I'll illustrate in the next slide, but suffice it to say that efficacy of current drugs is no better than uh, for antipsychotics, clozapine that was discovered serendipitously in the early 1960s, and for all of the other drugs, no better than drugs discovered in the 1950s. Uh, the trouble is that, uh, that for at least these neuropsychiatric disorders, the field has been condemned to recycling a very narrow set of hypotheses uh, that often were reverse engineered from the mechanisms of drugs that are in truth, if you look at antidepressants, pretty mediocre. I did a, uh, this morning, I did a PubMed search on the number of uh, association studies done with the serotonin reuptake transporter and found, to my chagrin, 2,557, so a terrible waste of human capital. Uh, but fortunately, now unbiased, large-scale genetics is pr providing a window onto new biology so that we can escape this... Uh, this hall of mirrors that we have found ourselves in. Now, the assumption for the study of uh, these disorders, which are polygenic, uh, is uh, that uh, the many hundreds of genes and probably many thousands of alleles are going to converge on a much smaller number of molecular pathways, molecular machines, uh, but even still, uh, these are going to be very hard problems for neurobiology if we're going to move toward disease mechanisms and therapeutics. As a community, I will argue, and I hope uh, people will agree, that what we must do is to drive the genetics to the point where we can see across these disorders. Uh, Previn Mortensen and I were just chatting um, uh, before coming in that the idea of picking individual disorders where the boundaries are arbitrary anyway isn't really going to work. We have to look at broad swaths of uh, psychopathology and neuropathology and brain disorders and, um, and get to the point of, of seeing convergence on molecular mechanisms. And here we can take a lesson from cancer, where the tissue of origin, of course, matters to the surgeon and the radiation therapist, but for medical oncology, what matters are the molecular, it, there it's, uh, cancer's an easier hard problem, right? The, the uh, somatic mutations, for example, in, in the cancer that can be targeted with drugs. Um, and we, we, we can imagine that there will be some interesting convergences that will put uh, uh, therapeutics in the hands of both neurologists and psychiatrists. Along the way, though, we're going to need a new molecular toolkit and new disease models to understand mechanisms and, and discover therapies. We're going to need, if we're going to be interrogating uh, thousands of alleles or at least hundreds of genes, we're going to need, you know, we're not going to make many thousands of transgenic mice, which any, in any case are evolutionarily problematic for some issues. So as I, as I noted, and just uh, briefly, you know, there's been this just terrible therapeutic stasis. Uh, lithium, antipsychotics, antidepressants, and even in a way benzodiazepines were discovered by serendipitous observation lithium in guinea pigs and then humans and antipsychotics and antidepressants first in humans. And what is really striking is that we are at an efficacy impasse and that there's not a single widely used psychotropic drug that has a molecular target other than those of these prototypes. And again, this is where unbiased genetics uh, really can make a huge difference. Uh, now, 
we, we have other challenges, of course. One is the, uh, not only the genetic complexity of the disorders, uh, but, but their intrinsic heterogeneity. And by the way, this is true of all common chronic human disorders, type 2 diabetes, hypertension as well. But we have a different problem as well for our neurobiological models, that is putting the genetics to work, and that's the in inviolability of the human brain and life. Now, I've already said cancer is a hard problem, but it's an easier hard problem, because when a cancer surgeon does an excisional biopsy, they hand the scientist the disease. Uh, this is, uh, so the Incas, this is an Inca-era skull, did trephination to permit evil spirits to exit. Uh, this apparently is no longer considered safe or efficacious, uh, but the point is we can't, except in rare cases of epilepsy surgery, we can't get uh, human brain tissue. You know, and even if we could, it would be of only limited value because at least the, the neuropsychiatric disorders are diseases of widely distributed circuits, and we'd learn a lot from certain cells, but it would not be the whole picture. Uh, we also lack uh, and we'll come back to this, valid disease models, meaning, in my view, uh, models constructed with the same mechanism. Psychiatry's been plagued with a lot of uh, models where, you know, uh, a rodent doesn't swim long enough and that reminds somebody of depression. I mean, that's, that's really like classifying birds and insects and bats together because they all fly and we really have to do better as a community than that. And of course, we have the DSM problem uh, or the ICD problem, which is phenomenological diagnosis. This isn't anybody's fault, it's where the science is. But the lack of biomarkers uh, for diagnosis or clinical trials is, again, extremely problematic. And it's something that the genetics actually can help us with uh, enormously. So um, we've, we've known for a very long time, right, that uh, that certain neuropsychiatric disorders are highly heritable. So here's ASD, schizophrenia, bipolar, and ADHD, all in the 0.7 to 0.9 range of heritability based on twin studies. And yet the genetic information was inaccessible until we had the technology that would make it possible. The, the uh, microarrays, this is our beloved, oh, the, the Moore's Law I didn't show, but Moore's Law for computation, you know, the idea that computing power doubles every 18 months um, runs somewhere up here, whereas the cost of DNA sequencing has dropped. You can make up a number, but about a million fold since the Genome Project. You could tell a story and say that the first genome cost $3 billion. That wasn't particularly scalable. And for us, a genome now costs about $1,700 all in, although the data transfer and storage is about $500, which is not trivial. Uh, but but uh, this has now made genetic analysis possible across many, many disorders. And indeed, the, uh, the phenomenological diagnoses and the heterogeneity can actually, if you pick salient phenotypes like, like schizophrenia, like ASDs, like bipolar, uh, can be handled with enough statistical power because uh, there's no such thing as the reference schizophrenia patient, right? The, the people with these illnesses have not read our textbooks. Um, so at the Stanley Center, just as an example, we're focused on these disorders of high heritabilities with salient phenotypes. And we've, uh, although ADHD may affect, depending on the diagnostic cutoffs, you know, three to five percent of, of children, uh, they are all lower prevalence than, say, uh, major depression. And so we, maybe we're fooling ourselves, but we think that that helps us somewhat with the heterogeneity problem. Um, but at any rate, that's, th that's where uh, we have been focused. But people have taken on uh, major depression. There are some interesting studies in alcoholism uh, and so forth. All right, so everybody has seen, uh, uh, if you haven't, it, I, I already saw this on, uh, uh, on Pam's poster outside. This is from um, the 2014 Nature paper just showing just using microarrays to study common variants in schizophrenia uh, with uh, uh, 36,989 patients. One has 108 genome-wide significant loci. Uh, in the last 18 months, there have been, it's not, there's no data freeze, it hasn't been published yet. There have been another uh, uh, 10,000 or so cases added, uh, and now there are 128 genome-wide significant loci, and at some point, uh, the PGC 
which is this very uh, important global collaboration that we're fortunate to participate in, will we'll publish the next set of results. Now, of course, uh, these are common variants, so these are genetic loci which require fine mapping. Nonetheless, there's a lot of uh, important information uh, from this. And when it comes uh, to um, uh, rare variants, uh, of course, one has to sequence either case control design or trio design. Now here, I think a number of years ago, we went into this thinking, well, common variants are ancient. Uh, they've been through the natural selection ringer for um, you know, scores of generations. And of course, those will be of small effect. And that uh, uh, rare variants, especially ultra rares, will be relatively recent. There'll have been less selection pressure. And the, these will be of much larger effect. Uh, and to date, actually, the effect size of these rare variants has not been enormous. And I'll come back to this uh, in, in a second. But uh, with a whole exome study of 6,000 schizophrenia cases from Sweden, no gene has emerged as statistically significant. Now, colleagues who I, I really cherish uh, you know, cluster these things according to certain gene sets. Um, my view is we, that's, that's nothing but introducing bias, and we should just you know, pump up the numbers and work harder. But either way, the point is, uh, if anything, we've learned that rare variants are rare, and that uh, we haven't found a lot of uh, uh, really penetrant variants. But you know, there's much more work to be done. In fact, right now, uh, the, the Swedish group is being added up with these others, and these have all been whole exome sequenced, and uh, Mark Daly and Ben Neal and Steve McCarroll uh, uh, and colleagues are working on a joint analysis, um, which should be done pretty soon. Now, this issue of penetrance, even of rare variants, um, in retrospect, makes sense. So um, uh, this is a study from Power et al., uh, who studied the fecundity of uh, people with schizophrenia, autism, other severe psychiatric disorders, and what and and their controls were unaffected siblings, right? So you, that's a pretty pretty good control for uh, culture and family and so forth. Um, and a male with schizophrenia in this analysis has about a quarter as many children as um, would be expected for the culture for the country. A male with autism, the same. Females do have slightly more children, uh, 0.4. Uh, but uh, without going into uh, great detail on this, what uh, Mark and Ben uh, did is uh, they, they, they recognized that because of the strong negative selection on, on having kids when people have these disorders, uh, alleles of large effect will be quickly swept out of the gene pool. And that for an allele to be readily transmitted, unless there's some kind of balancing selection, uh, it's not likely to have an odds ratio of greater than 1.1. And so, um, so that, that we perhaps should have recognized ahead of time, uh, but it does rationalize the fact that, that rare as well as common variants also have small effect. And the reason I'm harping on this is because uh, the low penetrance of these alleles are going to create problems for putting this to work neurobiologically in, in models. Now, of course, there are de novo mutations that have been found, especially from trio and quad sequencing uh, in autism. And this is long published. These are some of the genes like SYNGAP1 and dirk one a and the sodium channel, SCN2A. Um, but uh, these, are, uh, these are genes that are associated with ASDs that are, that are typically associated also with uh, intellectual disability and often with epilepsy. They're very severe. And the point is that these are de novo in these families, and these are not very often transmitted. So again, this even though there are some genes of very large effect to be found in these neuropsychiatric disorders, these, these tend not to be found among uh, the transmitted alleles that are, uh, that are found in populations. OK. Now. Um, many colleagues uh, who have overlearned on Huntington's disease, or SOD1 ALS, uh, would, would say to me, Steve, why are you guys interested in alleles of small effect? 
and they would make up names for them that come from the old cancer literature, like they, they must be modifiers. Uh, they don't, as opposed to understanding that these are all causal influences, but they're causal influences in, an, uh, statistically right now they look like they're additive, but we just don't have the power to see interactivity, but nonetheless, uh, they are, they're acting in a convergent way. So the central hypothesis about why we care, I guess the main reason is that's all we have, right? But the, the other, the, maybe the better scientific reason is um, one, the lessons from all of prior biology and the emerging lessons even now, say from the schizophrenia GWAS and schizophrenia sequencing, is that this high dimensional genetic information does converge on a very reduced number of dimensions. And in schizophrenia, these things seem to converge, at least in part, on synaptic biology, including uh, synaptic structure and function, but also synaptic pruning. Uh, but there's a long way to go. Um, and the other thing that's really important, and, and maybe here I'm uh, preaching to the choir, but what matters is not the effect size, but the statistical confidence that an allele matters. Uh, because if you, um, if you relax your statistical standards because something seems biologically plausible or interesting, you can easily go on a wild goose chase uh, and then find out that the gene you're working on is not actually disease associated. And many postdoctoral and graduate student lives have been wasted working on you know, COMT and other genes that seemed biologically plausible. My favorite is uh, the gene disrupted in Scotland, DIS1. Um, and, and so it really matters that people have real statistical certainty. If that's the case, then an allele is just a way of finding a gene, right? It points out a gene. And so, uh, and, and then genes, of course, but here we get to the convergence. Genes have many, many functions in many different cells, but ultimately, genes do implicate protein networks, or in this case, this is uh, from the postsynaptic density uh, 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 with the NMDA and AMPA receptor, very much implicated in autism and schizophrenia. Um, Th that these uh, genes implicate these, let's, let's call them molecular machines. It's hard to really call this a pathway. The other thing that alleles do is they indicate the directionality when we think about uh, therapeutics, right? They tell us is too much of something being made, is too little of something being made, or maybe the allele is just an altered function, maybe something is screwed up in a, in a complicated way. But, but that's really the utility, and the effect size, again, for these purposes, it doesn't matter. It does matter if you want to make a model, you want to see something penetrant, and that's another question. So again, just to reiterate, we're, we're looking for this reduction of dimensionality into uh, many, many genes, into a finite number of molecular machines or pathways. But the other thing is that uh, the combinatorial information really matters. We need all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, I believe, I argue, because, you know, there's a, gene that may or may not actually in the end have anything to do with lithium action, but its name is disrupted in colon cancer, right? Uh, and there are just many, many genes like that which are discovered in uh, one organ system, one cell type, one set of functions, and then of course evolution reused them in many, many, many different places. And so um, we need, uh, I think the first clue to the, the actual neurobiology is, is getting enough information to, 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 to see the convergence. And in fact, one can begin, I'll come back in a few minutes, to single cell technologies where we, one can begin to have a digital map of gene expression. And you can ask whether there's a pileup of expression of risk alleles in a particular cell type or a particular circuit. But if you only have one or two or three genes, you know, they're going to be found in many, many cells, including mostly cells that don't matter to these disease processes. Okay, so um, I have committed the Stanley Center, uh, but again, with many collaborators, no, no one is in this alone. This is really a large community effort. It involves, uh, for uh, GWAS, the PGC, and now we are starting a whole new set of uh, sequencing uh, collaborations. Um, but if you look at this year uh, for schizophrenia, we're, we're, we'll, we should be up to about 70K, 70,000 subjects, 40,000 exomes, the 13,000 sequenced and being analyzed, 
10,000 whole genomes, and we're aiming for well over 100. I, th I think 100,000 is probably, unfortunately, probably too small, but uh, because we're still on the very steep part of the discovery curve when it comes to at least to common variants, and for rare variants, of course, we're really just at the beginnings, 60,000 exomes and 20,000 genomes. And I think these are realistic. And of course, these numbers are estimates. If the cost of whole genomes comes down, um, more of the exomes will become genomes. Now, autism is lagging in terms of common variants because the uh, major funder, the Simons Foundation, focused initially on uh, de novos and looking for highly penetrant mutations, uh, but is now funding uh, 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 Mark Daly together with uh, iPsych uh, in uh, Denmark, and Kevin Mortensen is here, and, um, and that is going to very much increase the number of common variants we know about in autism and actually many other disorders, but we're hoping to get up to 40,000, make up some ground by 2018, and you can see, again, uh, the uh, exomes uh, and whole genomes lagging slightly, bipolar is lagging yet further, uh, and again, the question, you know, why work on three or four diseases and not just one, and it's because the boundaries of these things are uh, really very suspect, and as you'll see later, um, bipolar and schizophrenia share 65 or 70 percent of their common variants. Of course, in the extremes, they're not the same. There are some patients who are in the extremes, and, you know, some really classic bipolars will respond to lithium, and crapolinian people with schizophrenia will not, but, but there really is a lot of uh, phenotypic and genetic sharing. Now, the other thing is, if we're really going to finish the job, if we're really, you know, and I think this is what we ought to do. I think that as a community, um, you know, we shouldn't play with our food. We should um, really try to get this genetic information um, in, into the public, done and into the public domain uh, within the next seven or eight or ten years so that people can work with it. And then, of course, genetics will hardly be over. There'll be enormously interesting genotype, phenotype issues to deal with and many, many others. Um, but if we're going to do that, then uh, it's important to recognize that if you look at the uh, PGC published cohort, now this is 2015, it's better now, um, this is, uh, the yellow is uh, northern European ancestry and this is uh, uh, East Asian. And so you can see it's a tiny sliver of actual global ancestry where this is uh, actually, I'm sorry, I guess it's all European, not just northern European, and this is East Asian. And so, again, we are committed to, with new collaborations, to collect, um, and this is, this is uh, where we are so far with collaborative agreements, uh, and these are not accomplished, right? These are, these are uh, agreements that are underway, but 25,000 schizophrenia patients in Shanghai, uh, 5,000 or 8,000 collected from eight sites in Japan, collaboration in Mexico City, particularly focused on the uh, Native American uh, aspect of that admixed population. And then very importantly uh, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, I think that there's a scientific reason for this. Most genetic diversity is in Sub-Saharan Africa among humans. But there's also a global equity issue as well. You know, if these diseases stratify in some way, uh, the last thing we would want to do is to contribute to the exclusion of sub-Saharan Africans. And so we've begun work here, and working, we, we hope, it's still uh, not, not finalized, but we hope with the Wellcome Trust and the Gatsby Foundation in Great Britain uh, and some foundations in the U.S., we want to create uh, training programs for investigators uh, in sub-Saharan Africa so that we're not engaged in the uh, ugly, classic safari research where you show up, take their stuff, and maybe remember to send a preprint. What we'd really like to do is build capacity. And indeed, I think it's really important because the truth is we don't know how to phenotype yet. Um, uh, ideally, every, collab every, every group will be able to have uh, cohorts that will be recontactable, and that will require a great deal of engagement, not only of the, of the the patients and controls, but also obviously of, of the investigators. But I think um, I think this is really worthy, and this is something that Karsten Cohen is is leading. These are the co-investigators. Okay, so we should finish the job for 
so, you know, not all disorders, but for groups of disorders that connect. Uh, and, and the goal is uh, uh, to diminishing returns. Now, a Supreme Court justice in the United States, Potter Stewart, in judging about free speech, and pornography said he couldn't define pornography, but he knew it when he saw it. And we're hoping uh, that when we see diminishing returns, we'll know it when we see it. But we suspect it will be we stop discovering new biological pathways. It's not that we start, you know, we're never going to discover all of the rare variants and every allelic frequency of common variants. But ultimately, when we, when we stop learning about new components of molecular machines and pathways, uh, we will think we, and again, we, I hope, is, a, is the whole community, are done, and make all data public along the way. I think that's really critical, because the goal, I mean, the reason that people with these diseases give us their, their, their DNA and their skin biopsies and so forth is so that we can solve the problem, not so that we can, um, in a way that I once when I was at NIMH, described as the pharaoh model of science, you know, be buried with your, with your data. Um, I've mentioned recontactable cohorts. Also, longitudinal cohorts are really critical because I, I think that the genetics is going to give us two things. It's going to give us new hypotheses about biomarkers. Already, all of the calcium channels that have come up in schizophrenia and bipolar give people a lot of ideas for things to measure that no one would have imagined measuring. And then the issue of stratifying populations for epidemiology. Um, I, th I think it's really critical. If we're going to turn um, uh, what are now, I think, proxies, sort of like urbanicity and migration or refugee status for schizophrenia into causes, I think iterating between genetically stratified uh, uh, populations and, and, and certain environments uh, could, could Give, give us a, a real uh, leg up on this very important environmental side of, of the equation. Okay, now that was a breezy, a, you know, breezy uh, trip through the genetics, but it's really to demonstrate what I think should be the ambition of this field. And again, for more classic neurologic disorders, I, I, I feel very much the, the same way and hope that others will, will as well. Uh, but how are we going to turn, it's easy to show diagrams of convergence. How are we going to do that? That's really, that's, that's really a hard problem. And the first thing is that we need models that will allow us to functionally interrogate this very large number of genes and larger number of alleles. And, uh, and I think we, we've come to understand across all of medicine the importance of human backgrounds. Uh, we've all been disappointed at many, many drugs across many classes of disease that fail in phase three clinical trials um, and then learn in retrospect, for example, uh, that in the immune system, you know, humans have cytokine storm, mice have cytokine storm. It's just that all the receptor responses are, are different. Um, and so having human genetic backgrounds and then the other thing is we really have to think of the cellular diversity of the brain. I'll come back to this. Uh, the Global Brain Project are now focused on giving us a census of the different cell types in the brain. But it's really important, again, classically, many, uh, many researchers in psychiatry and neurology had to deal with brain homogenates and binding receptors in brain homogenates. But, but we now know that these diseases clearly affect certain cell type synapses and circuits differently from others. And so we have to be able to identify um, diverse cell types. And so that has motivated, certainly for the Stanley Center, but I think for a lot of groups around the world, uh, uh, the use of um, iPS cell stem cell lines and, and so forth. And uh, then the question of animal models is also uh, very, very pressing because in the end, um, even if you, as my colleague Paula Arlotta, can now grow human brain organoids for the longest or 10 months, but they're still growing. But in the end, they're not, you know, uh, luckily, they're not going to look up out of their vat one day and say, I want to talk to a lawyer. Um, if we really want to understand cognition and behavior and circuits, we will need animal models. And I think there's a healthy 
debate about what's the best use of, uh, of, of mouse models. I'll come back to this and under what circumstances are primate models justified. But it's really important that we begin to take evolutionary conservation into account and to match models uh, with the questions asked. And this involves not only evolutionary distance, which I'll come to, but also the selective environment. Um, autism models in a mouse using a three-chamber test are sort of an interesting first approximation. But I also worry, and maybe I'm wrong, but I worry that you know, if humans socialized in the same way that mice do, we would be arrested, right? Because we'd be going around butt sniffing. And, um, that may not be an ideal model for uh, social behavior. And the assumption that the underlying mechanisms, right, the molecules, cells, and circuits are the same, I think is something that at a minimum should be empirically tested. Okay, so this comes back to the shared uh, common variance, you know, schizophrenia and bipolar between around 65 to 70%. Uh, I'm not showing this slide to show you the sharing. I'm showing you the slide to remind you that if the problem wasn't hard enough about having to study hundreds of genes and thousands of alleles, we have to think about genetic background. Because um, you know, we, we know that, uh, not surprisingly, that there are families that have both bipolars and people with schizophrenia and people with schizoaffective disorder. And, uh, and, and some of the difference uh, may, I mean, one, could be you know, the, the precise uh, mix of genes. Even more telling, there are some more penetrant uh, uh, genes, uh, like the Norexin-1 um, truncation mutations, where the same mutation, it, gives you, it makes somebody haploinsufficient for Norexin-1, gives you a schizophrenia-like syndrome or an autism-like syndrome. Um, uh, you put the same mutation into a cell, they do the same thing. So clearly it's the other genes in the human, the genetic background that matters. And so that means that the, our cellular models, because we're not going to, you know, in animal models, we probably can't possibly imagine the, the multiplicity of genetic backgrounds we need. Uh, we, we, we really have to think about testing uh, alleles of interest, not just in one line or two lines, but find some way, very hard, uh, no one's there yet, to industrialize this process and make it higher throughput. So again, as a sort of introductory view of where I think we're going, not a deep view, and you'll hear from later in the week, either tomorrow or Wednesday, from my colleague Kevin Egan, who's going to talk about some of our efforts in stem cell biology, uh, using two-dimensional uh, <coughs> neuronal cultures, we're now uh, very good actually using a method that was developed at Stanford by uh, Tom Sudhoff and Marius Wernig, very good at making excitatory cortical neurons. I'm not exactly sure what they are, but they, they, they are uh, good and have low variability. But we all have to get better and better at making different populations of inhibitory interneurons. It certainly is done. Uh, but for example, there's, there are important ideas in autism that parvalbumin interneurons play a particularly important role in the process. And again, making large quantities of low variability interneurons is still an important task. Using modern genome engineering technologies, it, it's nothing is quite trivial yet, but it's getting easier and easier to uh, take isogenic lines and add genes of interest or to take patient lines and even sort of rescue certain genes to make a sensitized cell line that might give you a phenotype if you add a few more genes. Early days, very exciting. Uh, but in addition, um, uh, this is uh, from Lancaster, but uh, Paula Arlotta, you know, and uh, our group is making really good brain organoids. And one can begin to see for the more severe developmental uh, 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 mutations involved in autism and intellectual disability, very clear disruption of, uh, of uh, the development of organoids. And so cerebral organoids, again, it's an early technology, but uh, they, they are beginning, you know, they're beginning to look, grow up to have six layers. So these, Paula would, 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 would give me a lecture if I called them ventricles, but let's call them ventricles. She's not here. Um, and one sees, uh, all of the various markers of uh, cortical layers 
and you know, comparing you know, fetal human brain, I'm not gonna take you into detail, uh, against uh, uh, these organoids, you know, based on markers, you could say these are layer five-like and so forth. Uh, these technologies will get better and better, but again, they're gonna be highly variable. Uh, there's no way we're gonna decrease the variability, and so again, we have to find ways of making them in fairly large numbers. The same philosophy that works in genetics, overcoming heterogeneity through numbers, is somehow going to have to be adapted to these kinds of technologies. It's not here yet, but again, as a community, I think it's really important because again, if you think about it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask you know, what these different combinations of genes do. We're gonna vary these combinations. Some questions, some very simple questions about molecular mechanisms we might be able to study in just isolated cells in 2D culture. Others that are more developmental will probably be able to study in organoids and nobody has, uh, and the organoids and the cells really look young, right? The organoids look literally like a nine-month fetus. So we can't study Alzheimer's disease yet. Nobody's figured out how to get really mature cells. Um, but, but again, it's something that the community really should be working on. I've mentioned um, the issues of evolution and animal models. Uh, I always think, you know, depending on your question, you should work in the simplest model possible. So if you can work in yeast, that's, it's uh, really advantageous, it's cheap, and you can make beer at the end. Um, but, um, uh, but we have to remember that when we're doing basic science, we're, we're completely unconstrained with respect to the organism that we use. We're just looking for general principles. But when we're doing translation, and we're thinking, for example, about a drug target, uh, that drug target has to, it, it's not the only molecule that has to be conserved in your model, right? It has to be connected, it has to be in the right kinds of cells and in the right kind of circuit. Uh, and in the model, the behavioral readout may be somewhat different from the human, but, but you have to really study these mechanistic aspects of, uh, of uh, conservation. And so, you know, um, I, again, depending on what kind of gene you're studying and what question you're asking, you know, uh, moving now beyond cells and culture, some things are gonna be much easier in zebrafish, some things in uh, rodents, clearly no one's gonna work in chimps, uh, but, but there, there are CRISPR-Cas9 engineering of marmosets, and in China there are CRISPR-Cas9 engineered macaques already with some of the autism, autism genes, and you know some of that's been published. Um, so, I don't think this is just, repetition. So all right, we should push the genetics to completion. We, we have to develop the right kinds of models, that some that are higher throughput or scalable, and animal models when we really need them to interrogate circuits and behavior, uh, always paying attention to evolution. We also are going to need uh, a, a new suite of, again, to put the genetics to work, of uh, of molecular and cellular tools. I'll just uh, illustrate uh, one with, uh, with DropSeq. So uh, again, uh, when I started in neurobiology, the first thing I did is, I, this is a human brain, I took a rodent brain, uh, put it in the blender, uh, spun out the nasty bits, you know, the, the, any bits of skull or things that were left over, and did experiments on the homogenate. But that's not gonna help us, it hasn't helped us, right? And there's this incredible cellular diversity. And so, you know, a really nice method from a young colleague, Evan McCosco, was actually to, um, now it's hard with adult brains because of myelin and vasculature, it's easier with fetal brains and easier yet with organoids. But basically to dissociate the cells and catch each cell in a little, uh, aqueous droplet suspended in oil and use that as a, your, your Eppendorf tube and I'm not gonna show the pictures of the little machines that lice the cells, um, but one can then do uh, RNA-seq you know, in these droplets. Now, it's still hard to get rare RNA species when it's seeing the common ones, but again, lots of people are working to push this technology. And so using the retina, which, you know, it, where it's very easy to dissociate cells as, as a control, working with Josh Sains, uh, Evan you know, found 39 cell types, and the reason they worked on retina was not only because it was easy, but because there's an answer key. People thought they knew every cell type 
uh, in the retina. Although, in fact, based on RNA-seq and, and the, this sort of clustering algorithm, uh, which looks like some sort of uh, contemporary art, but it's just a clustering al algorithm, um, Evan actually discovered several new uh, types of bipolar neurons, which uh, are now being, being validated. But the point is, uh, again, now think about this. You could take a panel of risk alleles for any disease of the brain, clearly, again, this is retina, and you could begin to interrogate you know, the, the RNA-seq profile in each of these cell types. And you know, one can ask, what, what cells are involved in autism? What cell types are involved in schizophrenia? In bipolar, frankly, if you ask me in a serious way, what cells and what circuits are really causal in bipolar disorder? I think the answer is we don't have a clue. We might guess that some involved in circadian rhythms were important. Uh, but, but again, just genetics, as I, start open, as I started to talk with, opens up new biology. The, the information we get from you know, really pushing the genetics combined with these single cell technologies now begin to allow us to return to the brain and uh, ask what cells and what circuits. Now, I'm not going to overclaim this, these technologies are early and they're difficult. One other thing we need, which is really hard, uh, and I, Seth Grant is going to talk later in this talk, and he's done some of these things, but we need proteomic interactomes as well that are cell type specific. Again, genes are expressed in many, many different cells. And, and again, if you want to have a drug that targets a particular uh, uh, protein complex, uh, right now, because we've used mostly because we had to, even the best dissections often have multiple cell types, neurons and glia. Um, we're, ne we're not sure which proteins are in the same cell at the same time. Now, there's single cell, I'll just show you RNA-seq. There is no, nothing like single cell proteomics. And so Casper uh, Lodge, who uh, is with us now, is working with Kevin Egan to produce biochemical quantities of identical I IPS neurons. Uh, enough quantity to do proteomic interactomes either by uh, antibody uh, 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 pull downs or by actually putting in uh, tags in the cells. Uh, and then, of course, the hard part then you got to check your work against human postmortem brain because uh, we all know that uh, the RNA and proteinaceous makeup of a cell that has grown up in an incubator is not going to be identical to a cell that has grown up in a circuit in a brain. But again, you know, there's going to be a lot of this uh, complicated iteration between uh, various cellular preparations and human brain. But I think it's really important that we uh, do make sure that we try to validate our work uh, in, in brain. But, you know, Casper, now this is, this is actually from a prior a uh, very nice project in uh, having to do with cardiac arrhythmias, but is beginning to find uh, proteomic interactomes, again, based on the convergence of these genes. This forms sort of like a template onto which to project some of that convergence, and hopefully will contribute to the efforts of, of therapeutics. Okay, so I'm gonna just end with uh, some recent uh, reports that show you that even common variants um, um, can lead to, again, unsuspected and new biology. So in uh, late January, uh, Ashwin Sekar, Steve McCarroll, and Beth Stevens reported the association of variants of uh, complement factor C4 with schizophrenia risk. And the nice thing about this finding, even though it was really unsuspected and new biology, it tied together a lot of observations about schizophrenia, although one has to be careful not to get too giddy because it's uh, you know, one mechanism probably among many. But we all know that schizophrenia begins uh, sort of in mid-teen years with uh, cognitive decline long before any psychosis and uh, excessive cortical thinning and, uh, uh, and then negative symptoms and then suspiciousness and then often attenuated psychotic symptoms and then full-blown psychosis. Um, and in 1983, a man named Erwin Feinberg, who was doing sleep EEGs, who had just read about these new findings 
that, uh, that there's a wave of synaptic pruning in frontal and temporal association cortex in mid-teen years, came up with this hypothesis that schizophrenia might relate to over pruning because he saw this incredible change in the sleep EEG at about the same time that you see this pruning. So that has sat there along with uh, post-mortem studies from David Lewis's lab showing fewer uh, dendritic spines and lots of imaging showing uh, cortical thinning. Uh, and then um, Ashwin, an intrepid graduate student in the McCarroll lab, fine mapped in the MHC locus and just as Alzheimer had called schizophrenia the graveyard of neuropathologists, the MHC locus because all of the rearrangements was said to be the graveyard of uh, many a geneticist. But he found that this uh, highest peak in the GWAS, the, the highest tower in this plot, uh, ac actually there were three signals, but the biggest one was complement factor C4. And uh, what's really striking is that uh, the, the, the highest risk allele of C4 gives you the highest level of expression of C4 in the brain and so forth. It's, it's linear with levels of C4 expression. And if you knock out C4 in a mouse, so this is, uh, this is looking at pruning in the visual system, the C4 hom homozygote knockout under prunes, the heterozygote is intermediate, and here's, here's the wild type, and the overexpressors are now being made. So now, to me, this is a great use of a mouse model, right? You're looking at a fundamental biological process synaptic pruning, the vi mouse visual system has been very well studied, and you get uh, a really convincing result. One reviewer actually had the sign reversed, schizophrenia over prunes, these are knockouts, they under prune, but asked whether the mouse had any schizophrenia-like behavior. This was in nature, oh my God. Uh, but, uh, but asking whether, the whether we can make a mouse with schizophrenia is, I think, the wrong question, right? But asking whether we can understand basic mechanisms uh, created by uh, these uh, variants, I think that is, that is really a good mechanistic question. And I'm gonna skip, because uh, there's just five minutes left, and I, I think we, I wanna leave some time for questions. One, another interesting story about a T-channel. So, uh, I'm sure I've left a lot of names off, but you know, this is, uh, this is a very large community, not only at the Broad Institute, but um, but uh, at the Karolinska in Denmark, Cardiff, Mount Sinai, Hopkins, uh, Novartis, and, and now new, I haven't added all of our African collaborators. Uh, this is a big community effort. But um, uh, I, th I think the idea is at least you can see whether you agree or not. I, I, I hope that as a community we can be extremely ambitious and, uh, and, and, and really uh, push the genetics to completion make everything public, and begin to work on the neurobiology in ways that don't shirk our responsibilities to make the new tools and models that we're, we're just going to be in desperate need of if we're going to put the genetics to work and not end up with a really tragic result for people with these diseases, which would be to have very nice gene lists and no new therapies. Thank you. Steve? I really enjoyed your depressing seminar um, because what you didn't <laughs> tell us at the end, and I was hoping you were going to, having given all of this, is the thing that you started out with, which is saying the drugs are lousy. Yeah. So with all of this stuff, where did the drugs come in? Yeah. Well, it's early day. You know, uh, if you, somebody, I think Mark Fishman, who was the head of discovery at Novartis, just retired a few months ago, did this chart, and it is depressing. He showed that the average time between a basic discovery and a registered available drug is about 40 years. Now, maybe we're smarter than that now, but what the pharmaceutical industry says is the time between a lead compound and an approval is often 19 years. Um, so uh, maybe we should all be in denial. Um, so, you know, the C4 result is kind of interesting. I think we will tamper with synaptic pruning at our peril, right? Under pruning isn't very good either. But, you know, we and others have collaborations now trying to get serial CSF measures from uh, young adolescents in the ultra high risk state and trying to get, there are pet ligands for activated microglia, which are what respond to the C4 signal. We try to make better ones to get some biomarkers. 
which will be part of the puzzle. And then, you know, uh, maybe, maybe we can interfere with pruning, but if not, maybe we can do something about the synapses, which perhaps don't smell right to the microglia. So there are a lot of ideas, but it is, as you imply, very early. And uh, we can be, we have to somehow be sober, but hopeful. Like a good gambler, maybe a compulsive gambler. Yes, that. yes. And my impression is that the cost of sequencing has kind of slowed and it's, it's, it's yeah. no longer sequencing it's as right. rapidly That's as it right. used to. And so I, I, are we going to need a change in technology for sequencing to bring the cost down far enough yeah. to, uh, to, to do tens or hundreds of thousands of people? Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, and the, and the, 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 the data issues are also yeah. very limiting. So, sure. you know, Illumina yeah. has been yeah. such an amazing company that they become dominant and uh, wouldn't be, uh, you know, as much as uh, we rely on them, I wouldn't mind. They, they probably would say they would mind, but maybe they don't mind if there were some really good competition to drive, uh, to, to drive some, some new technologies. I think the um, computing aspects are also yeah very complicated because the data sets are now so large that uh, ultimately they, these are going to have to be uh, in the cloud and we'll have to do the compute in the cloud and there will only be enough bandwidth to download your summary statistics. And this collides with the concerns of many countries and uh, patient groups and ethics committees about privacy and we, we have a, all of us have a lot of sorting out to do. It's a wonderful talk. Um, can I ask you to speculate on this observation that uh, there's so much overlap in the genetics of different uh, psychiatric disorders, so schizophrenia and bipolar, but yeah. also with major depression. So how do you view that? Do you think that there is a common set of genes and you know a, com a set of determinants that makes you go towards the direction yeah. of schizophrenia? Yeah. Or are these major genes? What is that? Because it seems yeah, yeah. like we need to reevaluate this from the clinical part. Right? Well, I think there'll be some speakers later in the program who will have ideas on this as well. But in, in, in my view, um, there is a suggestion that there are at least much larger clusters of psychopathology with shared genetic and non genetic risk factors that the DSM and the ICD has inappropriately broken into isolated silos. And that's why so many poor people with these diagnoses get four or five, you know, a kid with an ASD and ADHD and OCD and anxiety probably doesn't have four independent illnesses, right? Um, and I think that uh, we probably have to in some way start over um, you know, looking, I mean, it's, it's dangerous, you know, the, the same genotype can give you very different phenotypes, and we don't want to create the opposite problem of saying, you know, there are three illnesses, right? Um, but I do think we, we will have to start over in a genetically informed way. How close are we there? No, no, we... So the good news is there are a lot of people looking at this data and already, I think, thinking in very constructive ways about how diagnosis is going, uh, going to look. Um, and I think uh, the genetics tells you very clearly there, there are no discontinuous categories, right? There, these are continua with, uh, with health. Uh, we were just some discussing uh, uh, at at breakfast, but there, there are data that some cluster of genes that in another context give a risk for ASDs uh, actually increase or are associated with higher IQ and with uh, greater academic attainment, right? So uh, I think we're going to end up in a world with these interesting continua between health and, um, and illness that, would, where, that has to be thresholded based on disability and distress, not on some, you know, five of nine for two weeks. 
Uh, and then across these disorders, there, there will be spectra. You know, it's a bit like, you know, Wittgenstein will say, you know, these are like family resemblances. These are not independent categories. Yes. Well, it's only at that point when you have a good handle on the full extent of right. overlap. The problem right now is that we're starting, I think, prematurely to look at a lot of these phenotypic overlap, overlap when you only have pieces of the actual right. actual. right, right. We want to give great epidemiologists like Preben, who you'll hear from soon, all of the tools they need to relate genotype and phenotype and help us understand these things. Hmm. I, 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 families may help, but right now I think we have really misinterpreted them. You know, in the nineteen in the in the dark ages when we were doing linkage, um, investigators we're told to ignore uh, bipolars and schizophrenia pedigrees as, you know, anomalies. And um, when I was trained in psychiatry, I would, schizoaffective disorder was called by some people atypical uh, psychosis. In fact, it's the majority, right? So I think we have to relook at populations and families both. I want to take the opportunity of asking you about and funding, right? Yeah. Around given your prior uh, yeah. role. So I think, as you point out, data sharing is incredibly important. Yes. And it works, it has, it's working well in some fields, but not necessarily all. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, the IGAP GWAS was completed nearly three years ago, and you can only get the p values, you can't get the raw genome. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I think. I mean, in some ways, I think it's like holding up the. Fact oh, that it's not. Appears. Of course. And then I. Think, yeah. I mean, the second second issue is around funding. Is I totally agree. We need to look at more diverse uh, samples so uh, so that we understand the full global diversity of risk for all sorts of disorders. But realistically, funding is going to have to come from the first world, probably. Yes. It, yes. Absolutely. So how do we bring the, those nations? together to be able to co-fund the, the, these projects. And as you say, I mean, I do think that funding individuals or training individuals in those uh, countries is, is important for the next generation as well as for the current generation of science. Well, when I was uh, an IMH director in the late 90s, we put together a committee and we came up with the first sharing policy that you had to write a sharing plan into your application and then the peer community would decide whether it was adequate um, but the, another institute, the, the Child Health Institute, told the investigators, "Do you get your autism grants from us? We'll never make you share." So, uh, of course, the person who did that is gone, well, right? National <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right? But yeah, Easy but or so in the yeah. No, I think I think there are a few things. I, th I think many foundations, which are often driven by the interests of people with these diseases and families, really are strong proponents of sharing. And certainly the funding that we're using for this is philanthropic funding um, and, and we have substantial NIH funding, but it's sort of tacked on. We have this policy that we will not collect. The, the way we collaborate is uh, everybody, we return the data to all collaborators. They get to analyze their data, but we won't collaborate with anyone who won't allow us to incorporate it in a meta-analysis, either the GWAS with the PGC or uh, the meta-analysis of uh, of, of, um, of sequencing, I think the foundations are kind of getting the message, but it's, a, it's, it's really hard. And I think the greatest tool we have are patients and families, because again, they, they haven't volunteered. They, they get incentives, but they haven't volunteered for you to hide the ball, I right? Yes, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, with the goal in mind of looking for pathways, do you think it's better to uh, sequence under 1,000 Caucasians or? 10 studies of 10,000 each of different populations? Um, we, uh, we, we, we of course have no idea, but I think that in terms of leaving global equity out of it and just looking at the, at the clues, 
uh, if you uh, you know if you were a betting man, you would say that uh, you need you know you need to sample all of the world's continents of origins and major ethnicities, and then on top of that, there'll be some population isolates. You know, northern Finland, where there'll be uh, perhaps easier to find alleles of, of larger effect. Um, 10,000 is probably a low number. I mean, this is really ambitious for funders and for the community. But the reason I say this you know, the way I do is because I think we really have to galvanize uh, these funding agencies. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of money that's spent on speculative neurobiology that would be a lot stronger if it were informed by existing genetic information. And so really, you know, you can't do these things serially and shut everything else down while you're doing the genetics. But an appropriate investment in genetics and, and as Allison and data sharing will lift all boats, ultimately, neurobiologically. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.